G'day and welcome to the Hunting Connection Podcast. My name is Zach Williams and I am your host. Here we'll connect you with hunters, fishers and outdoor enthusiasts from around the globe. This podcast will share hunting and fishing stories including past experiences and tackle the tough hunting stereotypes our community faces. We hope to be a positive influence to those outside the community while also having a laugh along the way. Hope you enjoy the podcast. G'day and welcome to another episode of the Hunting Connection podcast. On tonight's episode, I've got um, a Shooters, Fishers, Farmers Party candidate, John Kadarski. And a Katakazi. Sorry, I'm horrible at pronouncing, as as everyone knows. Uh, but... How you going, John? Oh, <laughs> Sorry for say. screwing your name. No, you're you, right, I, you're I, right. I told you I was going to do it. Yeah, you, you did. That's fine. Uh, you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be the last either. No, it's it's. Uh, I, I looked at it and I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to s- stuff it up. I practiced saying it in my head a couple times, and then yeah, bam, straight. <laughs> As I said, you're not the first. Um, so we'll jump straight into it. What inspired you to? pursue a career in veterinary veterinary medicine yep um i think it's something i sort of fell into really i I mean i grew up with animals um pretty much ever since i can remember like um both my parents were teachers and they um were breeding sort of i guess show horses or ponies you call them and um i think it was my fourth birthday um i remember we went to a, a racehorse stable somewhere down near morfittville and um they bought me this um, funny-looking pony. Um, it was sort of like a horse with pony legs, and his name was William. Um, he was a, a bulletproof sort of horse, and I think from you know pretty much the age of four, I, I started riding horses. Um, and then we sort of progressed, and um, my parents bought a yeah, property up in the Adelaide Hills, which was 20 acres, and um, they sort of started breeding a, f- a few more ho- um ponies for showing and stuff like that and I, I think I got more into the riding and used to take horses into to lead classes and I think I even got into driving and stuff like that but um, I think uh, my competitive nature sort of um, got e- exposed early on. I um, I started riding in uh, the picnic races, in pony races and stuff like that. Um, so I think up until probably the age of about 16 I was always had horses around me I was heavily involved with horse racing um during my holidays I used to go and um well I say volunteer but basically used to go and work down at um stables down at down at Morfittville and I used to go up to the country up in Karoonda and um ride horses for someone that I used to ride their horses at the picnic races so I guess to cut a long story short I I think uh all through my upbringing I, I sort of didn't really have intentions of being a vet. I, I just felt like it was a professional career around my interest. Um, yep. And I actually was always interested more in being actually a, a racehorse trainer. So even while I was actually at, at university, um, you know, I was getting up in final year at like 2.30 in the morning and going down on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings and, and working down at Ramwick, um, helping cleaning out stables and stuff like that. So my intention was actually even in final year to be a, ho- a racehorse trainer rather than, than a vet. So it was just one of those things I sort of fell into. Um, after I graduated, um, one of the other things throughout my teenage, which sort of was a, a, a conflict for me, was you know at one stage I wanted to be a professional jockey and then at the other stage I was... Um, a fairly handy BMX racer so <laughs> they sort of um, one was you know going to the gym and getting stronger and one of them was trying not to eat too much to get um, to keep your weight down so um, I think I was around about when I was 16 I made the decision to sort of focus on my um, bike riding um, and um, once I graduated from uni I actually came back to Adelaide and 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 focused on my uh, bike riding and um, I decided to just get a weekend job as a vet um, just so that I didn't, so that I was employable at some stage, and then, um, you know, here I am now, twenty something years later. Um, I started my own vet practice, and I guess the rest is history, I suppose. Yeah, beautiful. So you've always had a passion working with animals, 
Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that's interesting is people I say, "Oh, you're a, you're a vet. You you must love animals and 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 stuff like that." And and I think it's um, look, there's certainly some animals you don't love, um, <laughs> but um, I think I, I think some people get into the veterinary side of things with that mantra of loving animals, and I, I think sometimes that's a little bit detrimental because I think it emotionally it um, if you're purely an animal lover. Um, it can affect your decisions um, and I think emotionally it can uh, affect how you perform. So um, I probably like to use the word an animal advocate. I think um, I think sometimes you need to be a little bit removed from the emotional aspect of, of your decision-making and, and, and it's a complex um, situation. Sometimes you're dealing with, um, you know, you, you, now we've humanise animals and pets and, and they're part of the family and, and there's a lot of things going on and there's, you know, there's the financial constraints, there's what people would like to do and what they can afford to do. Um, so I think if you can get too much drawn into the animal um, lover sort of aspect, I think it, it negatively affects your emotional state and I, I think that's one of the issues that faces the vet profession a lot at the moment. Yeah, you you're definitely seeing a lot of that. Um, you know, we we caught up f- for a, for a drink at a pub and a talk to discuss this whole whole podcast after um, Robert Borsack from the Shooters Fishers Party, Farmers Party put us in contact. Yep. And um, yeah, we we had a sim- similar conversation about how you know the the suicide rates in in vets and yeah, and and it's a, there's a lot of other things as a, a you know high perform a high percentage of the the vet profession are females and and they you know throughout their career their their priorities change as they ha- as they have families and stuff like that so it's sort of contributed to the shortage but it's sort of interesting you know like i said people um stereotype vets as being animal lovers which you know i think at heart we are and and um you know i've definitely done and i think i've said this to you before i i've definitely done some (laughs) crazy things on with animals where you just saw that spirit to live but i I also remember the story you told me about um the goat that you found on the side of the mountain and yeah um you know i think people on this podcast would understand that um you know hunters probably get um hard with the whole thing is you, you know you don't respect animals and you, you, you're not trying to um you're not involved really with conservation you're trying to kill them all the time and stuff like that but um that story which i don't know if you've, you've told on the podcast <laughs> yeah before, I, I reckon i might have but um, yeah but yeah like um you know finding a an animal on the side of the hill <laughs> and, and taking it down to greener pastures and then every year you're seeing it that it's it's had another kid every year type of thing so i think um yeah, I, I think in every aspect of life or pursuit that we take, um, there's there's things that are taken um, way out of context and are very misunderstood. Yeah, definitely. Like the whole respecting of wildlife and conservation. Like everyone, as you said, sees hunters as cold-hearted killers, but you know, hunters tend to be some of the biggest biggest softies I've ever met. You know. Yep. Um, you know, like even recently, I've been out out hunting one of my local fallow blocks, and there's this year old fallow, and it's just its whole back end's lame. But every time I've had an opportunity to put it out its misery, um, you know, something's happened, and it's spooked. Like the last three times has been with my my four year old son. He's got like gone up off the backpack and started walking around and spooked it off. Um, the other morning, I made a rookie rookie as mistake and I'd forgot my release aid, the thing that you put on your wrist to be able to shoot the bow, and it's it you, you use it as a trigger for a bow. Um, I left that at the car, so I got into forty meters of these deer and they were feeding towards me, and I put my arrow on the string and went to go clip my release aid onto the string, and I've gone. Oh no! So <laughs> I've I've had about four times on this this fellow that I just want to put out its misery because its whole back end's lame. I reckon it's been hit by a car and just like stumbles along. Yeah, and I, I think that's something that we sort of I, I know when we have to put people's pets to sleep or euthanize them. I guess is the correct term. And um, the number of times people say, "Oh, you you know you must hate this as part of your job," but um, I think you sort of become. Um, well, 
from my perspective, I think you have to become a little bit of immune to that and, and realise there's other perspectives. And, um, you know, I had a discussion with a, a mate of mine only last week about, um, you know, they had a, they've got a 10-year-old dog and they've adopted a, a much younger dog and um, the two dogs don't get on and <laughs> the older dog has lots of issues and, you know, he was struggling with that whole decision about having to... Um, put the older dog to sleep and you know I knew at the time that that was the right decision for yeah. him to do but it, it, sometimes you just you, you're coaching people um to make that decision um and it goes back to what I said before I think if you get too emotionally involved um that becomes a drain on yourself and I, I think sometimes you have to be a little bit um immune from it and um and step back from the situation and try and just talk people through it. And sometimes it's just giving them permission to say that it's okay to make that decision. And it's sometimes not always um, the right decision um, for the animal, but it, sometimes it's got to be the right decision for the person as well. So, um, you know, I think the advice I always give to people is I, I think it's better to do it too soon than too late. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. Like um, I remember... Uh, would have been close to 10 years ago now we put down a family dog and shit i i cried cried like you know yep. we'd she'd been walking around with a limp for a while and we took her to the vets and turned out she had like cancer in her leg and the bone was about to snap yep. and we've yeah as a family made the decision and you know i had a uncle die a f- few months earlier and i cried more about the dog than my uncle it's it's I don't, yep. I don't know. It's, it sounds weird, but we do put these these emotions into into family pets, especially you know. Yep. So I, um, I'm the first to admit that I I do it as well. So yep. no, we all do. We all do. Yep. So, what led you to develop hobbies such as recreational fishing and home brewing? Um, I guess uh, well, the fishing side of it came from when I was pretty young. Um, I um, used to, a lot of my relatives lived in Port Lincoln, so I used to go every Christmas over there and sp- spend time with what I call my nana and granddad. Um, and so he was a fairly keen fisherman. Um, so we progressed from fishing on the wharf um, at Port Lincoln, where I caught my first fish, um, to then him buying a little um, 11-foot tinny, and we used to go in... Um, actually the little bay which is where the marina is in Port Lincoln now so I remember when that actually first started um so we used to go off of a place called Billy Lights Point and um so there was sort of some exciting days there um I remember one when uh we caught I didn't granddad caught a uh, a 52 centimeter whiting um just you know 100 meters off the shore which was pretty exciting stonker yeah and um I guess also having a day where we were just um, surrounded by a school of salmon. So there were just things when I was young um, that sort of just interested me. So, um, you know, I went through my whole time through um, university and then obviously starting off the business and stuff like that, um, not having the time, you know, working seven days a week not to get into it. But um, I've sort of got back into the fishing side of it over the last six or seven years. Um quite enjoying it um i think it's just that forced sort of relaxation although i think you know when you're on a boat you're still focusing on the things you need to do and stay safe and um you know one of my pet hates is uh forgetting to put the anchor rope up before you take off and and chopping (laughs) off on a propeller which i've done a couple of times now but um i've put strategies in place to try and not um do that but i think um you know the brewing side of it um I, I think I just mentally like to be stimulated, so it sort of fits into my scientific training. So it's um, um, there's a lot of chemistry involved in it, and 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 you, you can also there's so much variety in what you can sort of do. So it, although it's um, you're focusing on it, and and it just completely takes your mind away from other things that could be going on in your life. Yep. Um, so, you know, a day of brewing is just, it, it might be intense sort of thinking about what you're doing, but it takes the focus away other things, which I've sort of found interesting. Um, you know, and, and, you know, running a business is, you know, stressful. I think we got up to a stage where you had like 26 employees um, pre-COVID. Um, so, you know, there's always a lot of, you know, cogs and that moving within that business. So, um 
it's not just a matter of um, concentrating on you know the, the the finances and making sure you, you can pay everyone at the end every every week. It's 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 dealing with all the uh, um, emotional um, challenges and and personality cl- challenges that happen when you sort of start to develop a, a team of people working around. Which yeah. um, I guess one of the other things I guess from my childhood days, which I think I didn't really answer that with your first question was um living on the farm was um i guess my first um entrepreneurial effort so i um when we we're on the 20 acres i i used to um uh rear chickens and um both my parents were teachers and and so i used to um sell all eggs to the um they worked at two different schools so um, i had a thriving little business going selling eggs to the the other school teachers at both their different schools so i sort of had a, a an inputs column of all the you know food and all the costs of doing that and then i had a a sort of uh, an inputs column um so that was sort of my first sort of business um enterprise at a fairly young age but and then i progressed to getting um like young uh potty calves and and i, I think back in that day or showing my age a little bit but I reckon you'd be able to get them for about five dollars so um you used to drive along the road from um, Meadows to Strathalbyn on the on the market day and the the dairy farmers were too busy to actually go into market so they just leave these cow little calves out the front um so I think at, at one stage I used to have about seven of them on the go and um it was an interesting I think it was a good thing for me to learn about um, dedication and, and consistency. You know, it'd be raining and um, I'd have to go out and still make up the milk and go and feed these calves and stuff like that. So that was sort of my first two um, business enterprises, which, um, yeah, I, I, th- I think I've always been interested in the, the mechanics of, of business and, um, and yeah, it started at a pretty young age. And not just the business side of things, but animals. It seems that everything you've done along the way has has revolved around animals. So there's definitely that passion, yeah, passion to yeah. to work with animals. That yeah, I think I, I probably haven't known any different. I, I guess that's probably the bottom line. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. So jumping back to the the fishing side of things. Yep. What's the story behind your most significant significant fishing achievement? So you know, I I, I guess. I always remember the first big snapper I caught and, and well, I'll say the the biggest kingfish, but really I probably only caught one. But I think the probably the best story um, for this purpose is the biggest fish that I ever took home, um, which was a bluefin tuna. Um, but um, so I was probably, look, I may have been just in my early teens and it was back in, in Port Lincoln and um, my uncle used to drive trucks and um so during um summer he used to cut grain and um i always heard these stories um at other times of the year they back in that day they used to um unload the tuna on the on the wharf and he always used to tell me oh you know if if a tuna fell off the side of the truck you know sometimes they'll they'll let you take them and I'd, i'd watched for years these these tuna getting loaded on the trucks and watching waiting for something to fall off and nothing ever fell off and um, one day I actually had to, I actually saw a tuna fell off and I happened to be in the right place at the right time and the driver said, oh, you can take it home. And um, I was only thinking about this last week and <laughs> I, I think maybe the tuna was not properly frozen um, and that's maybe why they let me take it. But anyway, so I put the, um, granddad was there and we put the tuna in the back of the Toyota Hiace and um, went home and um, he went off to um, play his afternoon bowls and um, somewhere between um, when he left, I sort of, you know, got the rod out and I, I put the lure in the tuna's mouth and was pr- just trying to get my idea of how hard it would have been to <laughs> try and pull this thing in and, you know, I was dragging it across the, across the um, the grass and, um, you know, somewhere between putting that lure in the fish's mouth um, and when Nana came home, I decided that I'd actually caught this fish. <laughs> um so, you know, that was all good. I, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I caught this fish over on the North Shore and um, Nana got all excited and yelled over the back neighbour's fence and said, look what little Johnny's caught. He's caught this tuna over on the North Shore and they were all excited. And then um, the next step was that they were going to call the local paper. Um, <laughs> I think the local column was called Tight Lines. Um, and 
yeah, I think this was over 40 years ago. So I, I think with the benefit of that, I think Nana was probably onto me right at the beginning and, and definitely if she wasn't onto me right from the beginning, um, I can imagine what my face would have looked like when she sort of said, hey, um, let's ring up the paper. Um, <laughs> so this sort of went on for a little while and I, I jumped on my bike and rode around to the um, the bowls club and I said to Grandad, um, Oh, Nana came home and I, I told her that um, I caught that tuna. And I remember <laughs> him saying, did you now? And I said, yeah. And um, and she's sort of thinking that maybe it should be, you know, she's thinking about ringing the uh, paper for a photo. And she says, <laughs> oh, did she now? And so, you know, I, I can imagine he probably saw the funny side of it. And he goes, well, you've got a bit of conundrum. So I sort of... Um, came back from the bowls club and was sitting downstairs and wasn't sure what to do and eventually I had to come clean and as I said um, she sort of hammed it up and probably made me feel a bit bad about it for a while and it was definitely a family joke for probably the next 10 or 20 years but um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she was on to me right from the beginning. That's hilarious it's just that that typical fisherman's tale. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it shows it starts right from a young age. Yeah Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was definitely a family joke for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so good. Moving on a little bit, how did you become involved in the greyhound racing industry? Um, like I, I said, I always grew up with horses, so um, I think it, my first real um, thing was when I was in fourth year at university, and um, I had this um, whole. Um, Probably like most people, you, you see these images of greyhounds walking around with a muzzle and you're, you're thinking they're these aggressive dogs and um, I had to go and get um, one from a kennel and I um, sort of made lo- like this lasso out of a, a lead rope to sort of open the door and, and was hoping that the dog would sort of just, you know, go and put its head through this noose uh, and then I'd be able to walk it out and... Um, it was sort of like a kennel bank and it was just me and there was a couple of dogs there and um, it just ducked its head and walked under the lead and was running around and wagging its tail <laughs> and, and jumping all over me. And it was sort of the first time I'd really um, had contact with a, a dog and understood this sort of personality. And um, the other thing was one of the clinicians in my fourth year was a, a well-known greyhound vet and um, as I said, I was doing BMX racing at that time. So... You know, BMX race was about 30 seconds, a lot of greyhound racing is about 30 seconds, so it's sort of a similar physiology. So I actually did a, um, a study on exercise physiology with greyhounds, and, and so I guess that's where the interest um, started. Um, and then um, through final year, and then I guess when I came back to Adelaide, I sort of started to get um, a bit more involved with the industry, and um, I I think in the end, the difference between getting involved with horses and, and greyhounds was just an ec- economic one, you know, like I was still doing my cycling and, um, you know, I ended up getting like two or three greyhounds in the back shed. Um, it was easy to set up kennels, it was easy to get involved. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's where it sort of started and um, I guess um, in, eventually I sort of, um, my first property that I bought was um, a five acres at Lewiston and that was basically so we could have more greyhounds yeah beautiful what what barriers are there to getting into greyhound racing and like what are what are the type of things you have to do for the training and you know starting to race them back back then it wasn't there wasn't a lot of barriers to get involved and I, i think now it's a lot it's it's a bit more difficult you know there's um more formal things that need to be done um like police clearances and um there are some more questionnaires and stuff like that that you have to do, which is probably um, a good thing, I suppose, that people have better um, understanding of the husbandry and um, the requirements of and responsibilities of looking after the dogs because um, it's not just a matter of taking it from the kennel to the race. There's a, there's a lot that goes on. Um, I sort of it, – it's one of my bugbears when I hear people talking about, um, you know, the dogs going, they're being rescued. Um, so when they, they get adopted out, they're being rescued. I mean, these dogs get, you know, a lot of them get bathed um, every week or, or quite regularly. They they get their food weighed out to the, the gram, you know, <laughs> twice a day. Um, they get um, 
a lot of social interaction with their owners and stuff like that. So, you know, it's very misunderstood um, the bond between the greyhounds and, and the trainers and, um, you know, it, it's it's quite complex, um, the, the training of them. Um, it's not just, as I said, it's not just a case of putting them in the car and taking them to the track. There's, you know, they get massage, they get lasered, they get physiotherapy, um, they get, like, chiropractor treatments. So, um you know, when, when I compare uh, the amount of hands-on actual treatment they get compared to a normal domestic animal, <laughs> they're, they're, it's pretty amazing. And, and they're, they're pretty amazing animals. Like, um, from my veterinary perspective, the things that um, they just tolerate in terms of an examination or, or procedures that you may need to do on them compared to what a, a pet dog is, they're just, they're just amazing. Um, and as you see, we've got two here. Um, Super you know, friendly. Yeah, they're, they're, they're amazing dogs. And I know my, my father-in-law, he, he said to me, oh, if you didn't have greyhounds, what, what type of dog would you, ha- would you have? And I said, well, I, I'd never have any other dog, you know. They're just, um, to me, they're just, you know, they're, 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 they're the ideal pet. Yeah, they're, they're, they're gorgeous. I, I had a big cuddle before when I come yeah. <laughs> come through the door. Yeah. Big, absolute big sooks. <laughs> yes, very happy to, you know, they yeah, and that's the thing. I, I think a lot of people think, um, you know, they need a lot of exercise, but they're basically just couch potatoes, and you know, <laughs> they might get up and have the five minutes of madness uh, once a day, whether it's in the morning, at night, depending on their their time frame. But um, yeah, they're very they're pretty low maintenance. So, what type of things do you have to do to get in? Like when when you get a greyhound, a you know, are you starting training relatively early, and when are they starting to race? Yeah, I guess, and it, realistically, I, I think the whole process of, of training or socialising a greyhound pretty much starts from, you know, when they're born and you listen to behaviourists and, you know, they'll even talk about before they're born, which, you know, I'm not as convinced on, but, um, you know, they they develop um, their little quirks and social um interactions and that from you know pretty much six six weeks of age but um realistically in terms of the racing aspect of it they they get um we call broken in or educated um usually somewhere between 12 and 14 months of age but um realistically that also starts at a very young age you know playing with toys and um squeaky toys and all that sort of stuff and running around with other dogs and stuff like that so but they don't actually start racing the minimum age is about 16 16 months of age so but a lot of them it's somewhere between 16 months and two years most of them start racing um i think the and that's the other thing i I always find a bit frustrating is people say how they're forced to race you know and and these these guys they just they love you know if they didn't love it they wouldn't go around and yes some of them don't and some of them try a little bit harder than others but and there are some that you know they don't really want to race and they just want to be pets and and that's that's what they end up being but i think the vast majority of them love it and i remember um someone sending me a link and I think it's probably on youtube but um it was like an old um you know i, I want to say like you know maybe eight to ten year old dog all gray and was just sitting on a on a land room floor and um a greyhound race came up on the television and it started barking and throwing <laughs> toys in the air and stuff like that so um, I sort of, yeah, I, I find it a bit frustrating that people say that they, they get forced to race and they don't enjoy it because um, you, you see, you know, when other dogs are going out and they know what the others that are getting left behind know what's going on and they get, you know, they all get a bit excited and, and they get you know, a little bit disappointed when they don't get picked to go out and go and do their thing. So, yeah. Oh, it's almost like pa- playing fetch with your dog. Your dog loves playing fetch. It's basically yeah. what what the greyhound's doing on a on a yeah. greater scale they yeah. they bre- yeah. you know they're bred for hunting hunting well, dogs they're, and they're probably the oldest breed going around you know there's not exactly like a greyhound but a greyhound like dogs you know i've heard stories of them being um, pictures of them in the pyramid so you know whether they've been around for 2000 years that's that's what they've been involved in doing so um, it's just an innate thing for them what, how long does their racing career typically, like yeah. I know, it, you know, things happen? Um. Yeah, I think, mo- look, these days there's a lot of changes and, and for the benefit of the industry, a lot of things have happened where they've um, catered to for dogs to be able to stay in the uh, racing for a lot longer. So it's quite off, often you'll see dogs 
over four years of age. Um, so, you know, from two years to four years. Um, but, you know, we've... I think in South Australia, we had a dog that was racing at about six years of age recently. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, that's probably not the norm, but it also just shows how much a lot of them love what they do. Now, I don't know heaps about the racing, you know. I, I, I remember being young and going to one of my auntie's house and she'd have the dogs on because she'd be betting on them or, you know, horses. Yeah. So that's really my only, you know understanding of of the racing side of things is there different like classes for different dogs yeah. different age groups or weight weights I'd yeah so that that's one of the things i i think over the last probably decade there's been a lot more um emphasis on trying to create more opportunities um for even the dogs that are that are slower um and that's why we see more dogs now that are older and they're still racing so there's even what they call like a veterans category. So okay. once they get to sort of three and a half, four, they sort of race against their own um, age. Um, obviously, there's still faster ones and slower ones at that sort of age. But um, and then when they're young, they have um, they sort of have um, age restricted races, and they have races restricted to dogs that have had a certain number of race wins and that. So I, I think the the idea is to try and grade them so that they're racing against um, um, similar speed or similar ability dogs at that at that stage um, for the majority of what what goes on and so um, so you're not having um, you know like the the best dog in the state racing against the worst dog in the state so yeah there's a there's a complex sort of grading system um, to try and make it as even as possible and and then there's also variation that there's they start with different um, I guess barriers or positions and the track where they start from, and some dogs like it on the inside, and some dogs dogs like it on the outside. So, um, you know that that's sort of all the variables that sort of go on. But I think um, the interesting thing, like you said, um, about betting and stuff like that, is there's there's no um, human intervention per se. You know, there's not a jockey on the back. There's not human error yep. type of thing. It's a, it's probably the most pure form of um, racing in terms of of, of all the the codes no that's that's it's awesome to see them and you know one of yours is just on the couch having having a bit of a scratch and a and a roll around just giving us big softy eyes <laughs> yeah and and he was a really good race dog um you wouldn't know it like um when he's we, gorgeous yeah when we take him for a walk at the beach it's um it's all about him and he gets disappointed <laughs> if there's not a lot of people there because there's less people to pay him type of thing so um yes he's uh, he's very people um motivated on the breeding side of things is there specific things they're looking for when people have pups and are they like picking two different bloodlines to go together yeah there's a lot of stuff there's like a that? lot of theories um you know there's, there's everyone's got different theories but um there was you know probably over the last 15 years there was a there, there's a big emphasis with greyhounds to use frozen semen so um one of the most successful well, he he was the most successful breeder in the world uh, was a guy called Paul Wheeler and and he um, was very instrumental in bringing a lot of frozen semen from America um, initially um, and then later on from Ireland over to Australia so he was all about that hybrid vigor and not inbreeding them and stuff like that so that was only really accessible through frozen semen so greyhound um, breeding yeah probably over the last probably 15 years has been predominantly or almost exclusively um, done with frozen semen. So, um, yeah, and I, I know that was one of the things we were possibly going to touch on with, with frozen semen. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's um, allowed um, better bloodlines to be accessible to everyone at a, a more economical um, access. And also the interesting thing is with frozen semen, we're actually... Um, have been getting like higher conception rates, better success rates, so um, you know higher litter sizes. So there are actually less dogs um, being bred with, and potentially the better brood bitches or better bloodlines were being used. So there was, um, I guess, upscaling or um, improving the bloodlines was easier to be done with frozen semen. So yeah. um, I know Paul the. The breed I was talking to, he he sort of said that um, 
with doing the the technique and the and the frozen semen when we were doing a lot of um, the inseminations with him, it meant that he was breeding less litters but breeding with the better quality stock. Um, and then the out on flow from that was he was actually producing better dogs. He was getting more dogs um, to race to the track and and you know potentially less injuries because he was um, breeding with um, better genetics. Let's quickly touch on something you said there and something we chatted about when we were planning this podcast but when it comes to the the insemination of the of the greyhounds what's been going on there and then that will lead into our our next part of the questions yeah so you know it's over ever since i've been involved in the frozen semen side of it and i was fairly instrumental in sort of making it sort of mainstream around australia i went over and got trained in america and um at that time, it was only the vets that were freezing the semen, um, predominantly just vets. And so it wasn't really economical um, for a, an owner of a, a good stud dog to take it to a vet and get it frozen. And at that stage, it was like you, it was one collection had to be used as one what they call breeding unit. So it could only be used to mate one um, brood bitch. So um, I sort of... Um, talked to the people in America and um, we went through a process of actually training a lot of um, the stud masters on how to do the freezing and then there was a lot of petitioning about um, what we called splitting the ejaculate. So it, it, what it meant is that one dog um, may have been able to provide enough semen with frozen semen to do maybe five, six, sometimes even ten different inseminations. So yep. it meant that the dogs didn't have to be collected as often. Um, it meant that the best dogs... Uh, were more accessible to all the people who wanted to breed, which was sort of another way of upscaling or improving the breed. Um, and um, it was just a system that sort of worked pretty well. And it just, I'm going off track here. So what was That's the question? Right. Um, just so we're jumping from the the issues relating the yeah. insemination. And yeah, so part of that process, sorry. Um, That's all right. So part of the process, um, so when we... Because the ejaculate, we were using a minimum amount accepted um, to freeze us, uh, to get the, the, the girls in, in, uh, pregnant, which I sort of don't want to try and get too technical, but, you know, basically there was a minimum number, which we called 100 million sperm, was what we needed to get them in pup. Um, and so some dogs you'd get one mating and some dogs you'd get six or, or ten. Um and that process was involved a very minor surgical procedure, which basically meant we uh, made a small incision into the, and I, I did it in the side of the dog, and we um, slightly um, got the uterus out and we put the semen into the uterus. And, you know, at one stage I, I, we got 99 in a row, um, but I think on average back in the, in the early days we were getting probably 94% conception rates, which was... Um, pretty good and I, I think most people were getting over 85% and um, now looking at the statistics from Greyhounds Australasia um, across the board, across every um, uh, process which was done surgically, it was 85%, 84.9%. Um, so it's a very high conception rate and it, and it have um, a, an average litter size of about six and a half pups. So okay. um, it's very successful. Yeah. Um, so that's the way it was sort of done. And then there's been a push over the last probably decade to move to something what they call TCI, um, which is stands for, and I, again, I'll try not to get too technical. No, that's fine. Um, it's called a transcervical insemination. So basically it's like putting a rigid scope um, and using a camera to um, put the semen through the cervix without... Um, using an anaesthetic or a surgical procedure, which, um, you know, I, I know a lot of the greyhounds can be a little bit timid, so I'd be interested how many of them will allow that without, without actually being at least sedated. Yeah. Um, but there's been a political push to um, get rid of the surgery and use this um, TCI technique. And I know when the, the, the TCI thing first became a thing... Um, I spoke to a vet in America who I visited his clinic when I was over there and at that time um, he'd done more um, frozen semen inseminations than everyone else in the world and 
he sort of said to me, well, you know, I, I don't see anyone getting results at least within 10 to 15% of what we're getting. And I still think there's wor- concerns with um, getting, you know, tearing of the vaginal wall and, and, and problems with infections and stuff like that. So, um, but there's been a very big political move um, to get rid of the surgery and um, to introduce this TCI, which um, was one of the things I know you were going to lead on to is uh, about the, the government inquiry in, in South Australia recently. And um, it was one of the things that I guess I went straight to because there was a, obviously a, a chapter there and I, uh, and I looked at it. And um, it was based a lot on what sounds like factual information, you know, a policy from the AVA, which is the Australian Veterinary Association, that's saying we don't need to be doing surgery anymore because um, TCI is more successful. Um, And they quoted two studies. Um, One of them I read, well, I read both the studies, and um, one of them wasn't actually saying what they said it was saying. It wasn't making any claims to say one was more successful than the other. And the other one um, was saying that um, the TCI is more successful, but it was quoting a 45% conception rate with surgery um, and a 60% conception rate with the TCI. And uh, as I said before, the actual statistics are about 85% across the board, no matter who's doing it, um, as opposed to 64%, and that's with greyhounds. So um, immediately you have a, you know, there's a 20% um, decrease in the amount of, conceptions you get with TCI compared to surgery and that's been year in year out proven with statistics that can't be manipulated and the other interesting thing is it doesn't sound like much but um, an average litter size of six and a half for surgery and five and a half for TCI and and, um, I sort of had a bit of a debate online with some people about this recently and you know said oh you know there's not a lot of difference and you know we just statistically it's not it doesn't make much difference and um, I actually pulled out the figures that they provided and, and um, I worked out if all the dogs that um, were done surgically were done by this TCI technique, within one year you reduce the number of dogs by 35%. And in terms of the antis, who, the people trying to close the industry down, it, it, that's problem solved. Yep. You've done, you've re- reduced, you've cut the industry off of its knees. Um, so I just really would appreciate uh, an honest discussion and say, look, you, what you're saying, um, you're um, politicising this and what you're saying is not actually true. You, you're saying it as if, if it's factual. It's not factual. All you're trying to do is reduce the number of dogs that are involved or in in the system, which then affects the industry and affects the viability and it's basically the easiest way that you guys can make the vi- industry um non-viable and shut it down and and that's I guess one of the things that sort of sparked my interest and and I guess um that sort of made me look at the whole process um of how the government inquiry was done um and it was you know one person was selected and he had an offsider who assisted him um he came up with the findings I subsequently found out he only consulted with um one other um Authority, which was New South Wales, which obviously had gone through uh, a political um, decision or um, turmoil of, you know, trying to shut the industry down there. Um, and one of the other things that I, I guess um, alerted me to how ask questions about how this whole process was done, and and subsequently a lot of other people in the industry was that there was a a question about the um, minimum minimum kennel size. Um, for the dogs and basically all he appeared to have done is uh, a Google copy and paste of the New South Wales code um, which is uh, I think I want to say it's three and a half square meters for a kennel uh, for a dog uh, where Victoria which is ha- is a state that has a very um, prominent animal welfare lobby sort of state um, it has a smaller, kennel size so why was there no consultation with them and the interesting thing was um you know a while ago uh, the victorian authority was under a lot of pressure from people trying to um make it more restrictive and and close the industry down there and um they actually did a study and they found that the dogs that were kept in larger kennels tended to 
um, move more. So they actually had higher cortisol levels. So here we've got a government um, mandate to get rid of a, um, a surgical technique, which is they're saying is um, not as successful as the TCI, which is completely wrong. Um, we've got a mandate to increase the kennel size based on a Google search, um, not based on you know science and, and consultation with the other industry. And, and I think um, my frustration, and, and this probably leads on to what you're going to ask me, is why I sort of wanted to, what I, I sort of upped my involvement with the shooters, fishers and farmers was um, I feel as if the government in some aspects has been um, a little bit arrogant and somewhat incompetent in the way that the, the follow-up discussion has been taken with this inquiry. And and, and in, I'm sure this happens, and I, I, I know um, subsequently I found out this is happening with a lot of other marginalised pastimes and sports. Yep. Um, and so that's where I guess the political angle comes into it. But I feel like... Um, I'll use the word incompetence in, to say that you've picked one person to go around and talk to a few people and, and let's say I, I was on the Greyhound board for, for three years. Um, I've been fairly um, involved in the industry for quite a long time. I, I never was given an email survey or, or was spoken to it. And, you know, I'm not saying that I'm the authority on everything, but it just, you know, was there a bit of picking and choosing of who we talked to Um it's one person who consulted with one other authority in New South Wales. Sounds like they've Googled and pasted pretty much all their recommendations or, or um, you know, standards into this government inquiry. So um, I feel like there should have been some consult consultation um, internally with, with key stakeholders before this report was finalised. Um, you know, good decision making is not based on one person's opinion. It, it needs to be a um, a diversity of of experience and and, and opinions. Um, I also, yeah, I, I think um, incompetence in then not fact checking what's what's been said and what the recommendations are. So, um, you know, if if there's a mandate for an immediate um, um, ceasing of using um, a surgical insemination as a breeding technique based on information that's not actually correct or or opinions and um, emotive uh, agendas um, that sort of you know come across as if they're factual but they're not actually being fact checked and, and debated um, then I think that's fairly incompetent and I think there's a lot of that that goes on and I know Zach you were telling me about your um, radio that you listen to with uh, Susan Close, who's the Deputy Premier here in South Australia, yep. um, with her comments about the bow hunting. Um, so maybe just so I don't get – I'm not paraphrasing you <laughs> and get it wrong – explain. So she, so she was saying that bow hunting had been banned in every state in Australia. Is that right? Yeah, every state bar – I can't remember what state she said, but the ones that she said, it's like completely legal. I think it was New South Wales and Victoria – and you know it's they've they've done a big push there recently to get more bow hunters out you know hunting on public land and they've got you know New South Wales has bow hunting only areas where you can't use firearms and stuff like that it's that it, what's led us to this discussion is everything you're saying it seems that the same people that are pushing a ban on certain hunting styles duck hunting bow hunting um pig dog hunt like hunting with pig dogs you know um and, and then and soon to be maybe spear spear fishing spear fishing gray <laughs> you know the greyhound industry the racehorse industry it seems that you know all these people were behind the same same pushes and doing the same tactics yeah. in every form of it yeah, and I think, and I, I again, I want to use the strong words, but I'll use the word <laughs> arrogance. You know, like these are activities that to them they're making judgments on on their opinions and emotions. Um, and but the problem is that there are people who are involved in these um, pursuits, hobbies, sports, 
um, that's their life. You know, it's it's that what they get out of bed for. You know, I, I see elderly people who are involved in the greyhound industry, and their dogs are what keep them alive. It what's give them their their daily keeps them in a, a in a routine. It's that bond to the dog, um, and you know they're being totally um, arrogant or disrespectful of what people um, choose to pursue in their life. Um, you know, and in in society, you know, if people don't have a purpose, they, they lose their will to live. And and it's not just their purpose, it's their social interactions, it's their friendship network, it's their support network. Um, and these people are just making political judgments, often not based on fact, um, to drive their own agendas or, or drive agendas by people who are uneducated about what um, the real... Um, issues are um well not not even issues about what the what the actual um industry or hobby or, or support is about so i think that's the thing that sort of got me off my backside <laughs> about this um you know a friend of mine ran for the shooters fishers and farmers as a last minute thing probably two election cycles ago in in victoria and um that was sort of when i've i think back then it was just the shooters and fishers um, party and um, that's sort of what got me um, made me aware of it um, and then I think it's been uh, look I've always said my whole life I'm, I'm no politician you know I'm a, been a fairly polarizing person <laughs> over my my career I'll, I'll say what I think and um, I don't really care if it's an unpopular thing that I say but usually I'll, I'll back it up with um, research um, or experience um, and if I think someone's saying something that's not true, I'll, I'll call them out on it. And a lot of people don't like that. I, I guess it's that fear of accountability. Um, so, I, I, as I said, I think that's the thing that's got me off my backside is uh, this political um, agenda that's happened in South Australia with the greyhounds. But I've also realised it's happening in um, a lot of other aspects, you know, like the hunting aspects but there's also you know i've been aware of um, landowner issues up on the york peninsula with with mining rights and stuff like that so i feel as if there's um an appetite for um change or, or people um i think over the last probably 10 to 20 years there's been a a, a shift in uh, the traditional political um the, the t- traditional politician, I suppose. I, I think people don't want a traditional politician. They they want someone who's actually going to stand up and, and and say what everyone else is thinking. Um, and I think, especially in South Australia, I mean, look, what are we five years into not being able to fish for snapper? You know, I mean, yeah, um, we have a three year ban, and then my understanding is they didn't really have um, solid statistics on what the actual um, numbers were they didn't actually have um, egg counts that were accurate for the time of the year for when the the fish were spawning so let's just go and knock it on the head for another three and a half years which you know it's the old saying definition of insanity is do the same thing and expect a different result so you know what are the what is the i know initially there was some um stories about them releasing young snapper and that but what are they doing you know what what have they done for you know creating artificial reefs or what are they doing to you know talk to professional fishermen um, and recreational fishermen about how to create a sustainable um, um, stock of fish that um, moving forward you know like I, I've heard stories um, of the prawn trawlers having to work longer and still struggling to get their their quotas and stuff like that in in the gulf and and so what does that sort of say to you about the the whole food chain um in this sort of gulf which is both the gulfs which are you know critical um nurseries for for fish stock you know in the state and it just feels to me that there's not a lot of um positive um or things happening yeah, it's it's all over the place, you know. You got these marine parks, which are you know, depending who you chat to, are, are proven not to really do do much in the way of fish stocks. You know, you've got awesome 
organizations like Wreckfish, they are doing like the seeds for Snapper and doing all the the uh, the seaweed stuff where they're getting the the seeds off the beach and re re putting them out there. You know, they're they're putting Snapper back out, they're breeding and putting them back out, but. You know, when it comes to the South Australian government side of things, there's you know Piercer and they're not or Persa, however you pronounce it, they don't um seem to be doing much, and it seems to be just that same same few key people and organisations pushing against all of these these recreational activities. Yeah, I feel it, it's also like people say, oh, the Greens and 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 you know, back in the day, I I used to think the Greens idea was a good thing you know they're for the environment and everything like that but i think now it's become more of just an ideology and um and i think also it, it's not just the greens i think you'll you'll find also within the major parties there's um there's people hiding behind these major parties that are actually of the same agenda um and and unless you uh, really following what's going on you don't actually understand the different um, angles and agendas that are people that are coming from so um, I think there's um, and I, look I could be wrong but I feel as if there's a voice that needs to be had for these um, uh, I'll, I'll say marginalized activities um, it was interesting when I did my firearms course I, I I was actually amazed at how many people in South Australia actually have a firearm license and I can't remember the number but um, I remember, as I said, the political thing, uh, maybe it's been something that's been ticking away in the back of my head for a long time, but I remember hearing the number of, of people that have firearm licences um, in South Australia and I, I thought that, that that's a big number and that's um, a big number of people that aren't really having a direct um, representation on a, and a political level. And um, I think going back to... Um, what we were saying about um, you know y- your discussion with with um, with s- listening to Susan <laughs> on, on the radio is that um, I think as a as a political a mi- minor political party I, I think there needs to be a voice to be able to call people out on those sort of things. So you 100%. Know, if if you if you call them as um, someone from the general public on the radio, they shut you down. Whereas if in a political arena, they're saying something that is not true, and you call it out on it. Then, um, you know, it's it's political points, but it's accountability. You know, it, it, it's going to make them um, think twice before they start to pull the wool over people's eyes with just um, half truths and opinions. Yeah, that's it. You you touched briefly on you know um, one of your friends in Victoria running for the Shooters Fishers Farmers Party. What you've discussed all this stuff with the greyhound industry yeah um, you know the final straw what pushed you to shoot as fish as farmers party and how did that become um I, I just think it's a it's a common sense political party you know um and i think i i sort of touched on it about the greens and and stuff like that i actually think um when you read the policies and the ideology of the party it's actually probably more a green party in terms of caring for the environment sustainability of hunting fishing um you know farmers aren't going to survive if they're not looking after the land and stuff like that so um i think in terms of what we traditionally think of or historically have thought of as a greens party it's it's actually a very green um political party and you you read um the policies that they're just common sense so you know i guess um, I'd almost think of it as the common sense party, um, and um, yeah, I, I just it it just it agrees with my ideology, and um, there's um, I don't think it's something that you need to tweak. I, I think you can. Um, it's interesting, you know. I've talked to some people in in the shooting um, game over here, and they sort of said, "Oh, look, I don't know if we're going to join because I, we don't know what the policies are yet." And I was like, "Well." You know, until we sort of set up a, a committee and stuff like that, then um, you know the policy will be determined by the committee. It's not a not a one man show, but that's it. Um, but it, you know, I, I think they're going to be generally 
um, adopted probably from the national and New South Wales policies anyway. You, you read them, they're fa- fairly common sense. They're broad, obviously, in our state. They probably ne- need to be adapted for local issues and stuff like that. But um, I, like I said, I just think it's a common sense party. So um, your your mate from Victoria put you in contact with Shooters Fishers pa- Farmers Party? Yeah, and I, I started to get some emails and read about what they were doing um, Had after I, I joined the membership and, um, yeah, just created awareness. And like I said, maybe there was just a little thing that tweaked in the back of my head that while well, I've always said I'm not a politician, it was just one of those things that I, I – it was just – it was just tinkering away there, and like I said, this is maybe what sort of got me off my backside. Yeah, it just sounds like the kettle's been boiling, and it's just it's just reached that that point where it's starting to overflow with all the issues, and you're seeing more and more things. Yeah, know. I think as someone has said to me sometimes, uh, sometimes the best politicians are the exact accidental politicians, <laughs> the people that just stumble into it, not the, the ones that are, you know, in the la- young Liberals and Labors from university stage and stuff like that that, that are career politicians. It's people that um, are there for a purpose and a reason, not a career. So um, I think I definitely fit into that category. So as someone, you know, coming into politics... Um, I, I'm I'm not sure if you'd say you're a candidate or whatever. I'm not sure the 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 correct terminology there. But someone coming in, what what do you hope to achieve and um, in terms of protecting industry interests of marginalised industries and pastimes? Well, I think we've touched on a lot of it, but I think it's making sure the facts come out. So making sure whatever the activity or hobby that's under threat, I think. Decisions need to be based on facts, not not fiction, not um, emotions, not opinions. Um, it just needs to be based on facts. And, and so that um, involves, I think, making sure that the right people are consulted with, the right people um, get a voice. So, so sometimes, you know, you get people that go on committees and they're going to be the more outgoing um louder spoken type of people and they'll try and, and get their opinions across. But I think it also means you've got to um, try and consult with more the introverts. I think uh, over time I found a lot of the introverts that, you know, they'll be sitting in the corner and sitting and watching everyone and they'll actually probably have a really good grasp on what the solutions and what the problems and what the real issues are. So setting up a way of um, consulting with those sort of people. But I think... To answer your question, I, I, it's about account- accountability. And I think one of the catchphrases used to be, like, keep the bastards on us, you know. Like, <laughs> I think you've, you've got to, um, you know, if you're seeing something that you think is BS, you've got to call it for what it is and, and, and make them back up what they're saying with fact um, and make them being pretty careful about what they're going to say unless they've fact-checked it. Yeah, that's the thing. Like in, especially in the shooters' side, the shooters' hunters' side, there's always been a, you know, quiet down. You know, if 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 you're heard, they're going to try and take it away, and it just seems that old timey way of looking at things is changing. And you know, for someone like me, I've always hated politics and politicians. I've could not, you know, I just hated everything to do with it. You know. Um, you know, I never registered to vote until a few years ago and then, you know, all of this stuff started happening. I'm like, oh, shit, maybe I, I should have been looking at it a bit different and, um, you know, making my vote count and, you know, looking at actually what's going on behind these, behind the doors of these different parties, you know, because this, this bow hunting band's apparently been behind the scenes on the cards, you know. Apparently it was one of their their policies right from the start and it's just like, geez, it would, would have been nice to know that publicly before, you know, these elections went down when it comes to that sort of, sort of thing. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of that in a lot of um, group, you know, I going back to what I sort of know innately, but I know, although I'm not, you know, actively involved with the Greyhounds at the moment, but, um, you know, there, there's Facebook groups that are run by authorities that, um, 
you know, it's a closed group, but people aren't allowed to make comments unless it's approved by a moderator. You know, that that's not a, a democratic sort of situation. It's a, it's a dictatorship. And, um, you know, you see that, I, I imagine that sort of thing is happening across the board and, and it's, um, it's not a, a good way for um, relationships to be... Um, developed and it's not a good way for information or the free flowing of information which unless you've got the free flow of information you can't make good decisions so um i think that that's you know as a, a minor um party and uh, it's you're not under any illusion that you're going to be creating a government so you're not going to be making promises that we're going to fix the health system or the education system or the transport system i mean you know, you've got Liberal and Labor for that. They're, they've got a proven track record and what you see is what you get and it doesn't really matter who's in, in power. It doesn't really change. Yep. I think as a, a minority party, you're there to um, pick your battles um, and I, I guess specific for the shooters, fishers and farmers, It's um, we want to make sure that you can keep doing what you want to do on the weekends. Um all the nine to five stuff Monday to Friday that that's unfortunately in the realm of what the major parties do and and they're not you know it appears that they're not doing a great job and and maybe you know it's it's easier said than done to to fix those sort of systems but it's endemic unfortunately but um, I think we've got to focus on the things that are our area of expertise um, and that is protecting. Um, and being a voice for um, minority activities and sports and and like I said, just just common sense, you know, over, you know, uh, um, too much red tape or um, you know, just trying to make things too restrictive and and strangle them to make them too difficult for people to participate in. Yeah, that's it. Um, as uh, as as of as we've been chatting um, before the podcast, you know. You, you keep referring to the fun police like yep. you know there's the, these these people are the fun police just trying to you know everything that everyone enjoys they're just trying to shut it down it, it seems um like what would be your stance regarding the fun police and needing the accountability in the de- decision making and processes with the major parties i think um i i think it comes back to that whole thing about um People, you know, I think it's an, I'll use the word arrogance again. I think it's um, an arrogance to think that someone else's opinion is more important than someone else's, especially when it's um, involving something that they're passionate about. So um, I didn't want to use this example, <laughs> but, um, you know, there's, there's, we use a very catchphrase you know, vegans. So there's two types of vegans. There's the ones that choose it as their their lifestyle and, and a decision based on beliefs and, and health reasons, and that's fine. But there's also the other ones that it's their cause. And I feel a lot of these people that um, are trying to close down these other activities are, are like those vegans who are their cause. They're, they're not necessarily doing it... Um, they're not doing it for their benefit. They they think they're doing it for everyone else's benefit, and it, and it's um, I think the psychology is interesting because, um, you know it's oh how do I say this without being too bad? But you know they they're not doing it for for they th- they think they're doing it for everyone else's benefit, but realistically it's their own their own issues that they're addressing, um, and so when it comes to people trying to um, make decisions about bow hunting or um, you know maybe spear fishing and and deer hunting and and duck hunting and they've never actually participated in it then they're using their um, opinions and emotions um, about decision making and um, they're neglecting all the other social aspects um, that we've discussed already so I think um, like I said, I, I think it's just a matter of holding to account for for, for being factual, and, and not trying to pull the wool over people's eyes and and do you know behind the scenes deals um, that you know if they're going to support them on some sort of 
other major issues, they will push to um, make it more difficult for people to take on these um, or, or continue to do their, their weekend hobbies. That's it, yep. Um, Did and I answer the, your question now? Yeah. Yeah, I, think yeah. I, I got a bit sidetracked. No, that's <laughs> that's fine. You're, you're going down. It's uh, Like I said, for someone like me who doesn't really understand politics and starting to chat to politicians and that's a lot for me to wrap my head around and um, I'm sure it is for a lot of the listeners as well, but I think it's something that's very valuable that we need to start understanding. Um, you know, you said... The, the, the fellow, Jake, who ran the deer forum down in the southeast, you attended that and um, that, that um, like, you know, solidified you what, what you wanted to do almost when it come to, you know, running for the Shooters, Fishers, Farmers yeah. Party. And, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of hunters are very, you know, I would say don't know lots about politics. You're seeing, like, you know, talk going through the Shooters, Fishers, Farmers pages and stuff, you get a lot of negative comments of people, you know, saying, oh, you you worked with Labor on this, you worked with the Liberals on this, and it's just, well, that's how politics work. You have to ta- you have to yeah. take a loss to have a win in some... I think you've you got to pick your battles, um, and that's, uh, I think, um, you're not going to win everything, but I think the things that are important to your, your cause or your base... Um, you've you've got to really focus on yeah that's it it's uh, that's politics is a difficult difficult thing and i you know hand, hands to you for for sticking your neck out and um you know getting getting involved you know not a lot of people want to do, want to do that and you know it's it's something i could never personally do you know I, i'd probably get way too emotional my wife tells me all the time i get way too emotional when it comes to especially this bow hunting stuff um this anti-hunter vegan side of things you know like one example, we went to Monado Zoo a couple of years back and we're doing the, the bus tour and, the, you know, I understand that the the people doing the tours are, are volunteers, um, they only know what they've been told and we're sitting there and, you know, the the lady's like, oh, you know, these these animals here are almost extinct due to hunting, like overhunting, overhunting and just every second animal was hunting, hunting and it's like, I'm sitting there going no, like uh, it, like just under my voice so my wife could hear me, and I'm just like no, you're wrong. It's it's poaching that's the issue there. It's it's you know land stuff. I'm like actually no. The reason why you have these animals sitting in these in in these paddocks at the moment is because the hunters have made decisions to you know do conservation work, put their money where their mouths are, so that we can have these animals. Yes, it's so we can continue hunting them but because we want to hunt them we want there to be lots of numbers of them so we've brought them back from the brink of extinction and it's oh, I was just yeah. like don't you dare say anything and every second animal I was I was just biting my tongue I'm like I need to organize a tour with a bunch of hunters just to come on the bus and <laughs> teach, teach the the tour guide a lesson yeah well I, I mean my, look my other half she was definitely not that enthralled when I sort of mentioned what my pl- my intentions were and um but then you know she listened to what my reasons were and and I, I think one of the things is you can sit there and complain and whinge and moan but um if you're not going to put yourself out there and be a part of the solution then you're, you're really a part of the problem and I feel um like I said I, I just feel as if um the ducks are sort of aligned and, and sort of made me sort of step up and say well I have a, a unique um background and perspective on things and um you know I'm not afraid to call something out and, and say what it is so I, I think there's um it's the time to try it and it, you know, I'm not going to die wondering if if um you know as I said it's not um you know we're, we're still in the infancy we're still two years and till the next election so um there's a lot of water that's got to go under the bridge um yet but um I just feel like is it, it's it's a time for someone to speak out about things yeah, that's it. Um, you know, um, 
people listening to this, they would have seen that I've I've posted a bunch of stuff about membership um, for the Shooters Fishers Farmers Party. If you haven't done it, um, there's links on my page. I'll post links in the the podcast bio for that. Um, and yeah, if you you have any questions, shoot us shoot us a message. Um, I'm sure you'll probably get a Facebook going soonish. Um, yeah. So the the process is we, we need to get a, a a minimum number of of members. So um, you know, I, I sort of had contacts to, and people I wanted to follow up with and stuff like that. But until there's um, until we go through the the basics of uh, um, registering the lo- the South Australian branch with the electoral commission. Um, that's the focus at the moment. Um, then once that happens, um, we'll be wanting to set up a committee. Um, and I, I guess what I envision is a committee um, of people from a broad base of um, the affected or I'll say the interested parties. So, you know, like landowners. Um, I mentioned the your Peninsula sort of landowners group that have got issues with, with um, mining rights, you know, sporting shooters, hunting um, recreational fishermen, professional fishermen, those type of um, people are w- what I would like to be involved in a sort of committee. So you've you've got, um, you know, the idea is to be the dumbest person in the room and ha- have smarter people around you with all the other issues that, that need to be um, addressed. Um, and I, I guess the other thing is then um, to make sure that uh, there's a grapevine or... There's a people that you can pick up the phone with, or you can have, you know, in this day and age, you know, you have our online meetings with to try and draw out um, what the discussion or what questions need to be done, or if something comes up, you know, the right person to sort of talk to. So, you know, that's that's the second step um, in the process, and, and in that, that would involve, you know, more of a Facebook presence and and um, you know, developing policies once we have a committee, like I sort of said, um, you know, we m- might look at the, the national and New South Wales policies and, and see how they adapt or align with what the issues are in South Australia. And having read most of them, I, I feel as if a lot of them could probably just be transferred over. But, you know, that that's a committee decision. It's not, yeah. it's not a one – it's it's, it's not um, a one-person show. And, you know, realistically, it's still two years away and – um, the response I've had from a lot of people and the angst I've had from a lot of people from different things is I don't see any reason why there can't be multiple candidates for the shooters, fishers and par- farmers at the, at the next election. And, um, you know, and I when I spoke to Robert and, and Mark in New South Wales, you know, they sort of said, well, you know, are you wanting to be a candidate or you want to run things from behind the scenes? And I said, well, you know, as it stands at the moment, probably a candidate, but, you know, if someone better comes along, um, you know, I'm happy and probably my other half would be quite happy for me <laughs> to sit by the in the background and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it's just – I think it just, it, it's just – it's a process that we just have to go through. So we said said about the membership for South Australia. How, roughly, how many do you do you need to get in, and what's the process when it comes to we to need that? we need two hundred um, to get started. And I think we're well on the way to that. Um, and I know we've sort of started off with a, a, a free membership for two thousand twenty four. So, you know, there's going to be some people that are going to drop off. You know, if if they have to pay an annual fee and stuff like that and that's sort of expected so I guess the more the merrier um and I guess also the more people we get sort of involved um I think it's going to draw out those people that are really passionate about their cause and and their industry and then I think that's going to lend itself to selecting the people who who want to be on the committee um but I, I as I said at the moment it's it's a process of um, filling out the the membership form, and there's also a secondary form, which is basically a declaration to say that you're on the electoral commission. So, as you sort of said before, you only recently got onto the sort of electoral commission, so you, you need to be actually on the electoral commission to be a uh, a, a bona fide or a, an a accounted sort of member of the of the party. Yeah, yeah, it uh, seems a lot of people my my generation, you know, never registered to vote. 
I can't remember what happened, whether it was for Medicare or something like that. When, as soon as I signed, signed up to something like that, it just automatically enrolled you. Yeah, I, I, I think I went through a stage when I went I shifted from New South Wales back down south. I wasn't on the roll, which was always great because you didn't have to go and vote. But yes, um, <laughs> I, I was a bit like you when in, when in, when you start paying taxes and stuff like that. I guess you you get you get um, get enrolled and um, I yeah I. I just think um, there's the more people that sort of get involved in it, then I, I feel as if um, there's an inclusion sort of aspect to it as well. So you know, you feel that if you've got something to contribute in terms of policies or opinions and stuff like that, then it's going to be listened to. Exactly. A um, couple more questions. How do you plan to address issues such as net zero policies, offshore of manufacturing, and regulations affecting activities like fishing and hunting? So I think, you know, as a minority party, you know, you're not going to go and sit there and change global warming um, or climate change and all those sort of things. But I think... um, it's an interesting concept and it was an example was put to me recently where I was made aware of in New South Wales there was a business that, um, you know, I, I don't know the exact number of years it was but I, I want to say it was over 50 years it was in, in business and there was quite a number of people that lost their job when it got closed down and, and that was a business that um, was um, melting down um, iron or metal to be recycled um, and the reasons that I understood was that um, electricity costs were too high. Um, and so, you know, in Australia we've got this whole fascination with, with net zero and reducing our carbon emissions, which are all honourable things to be following. But it was an interesting thing that made me really think about the whole process of this because um, this business in New South Wales got closed down and, and then... Not only did people lose their jobs, but um, that process still had to be done. So basically all the metal was getting compacted up, loaded on a ship and then gone over to to India or China um, to basically have the same process done over there um, as what would have happened in in Australia. And, um, you know, if you believe what you read, Australian coal is probably a cleaner burning coal than what they may be using over there in in China and India. So the interesting thing is while the headline might be that it's reduced the carbon emissions that's happened in Australia, um, by the time you load it all up on a ship, transport it overseas, do the exact same process with possibly a dirtier energy source and then bring it all back here to Australia, on the global scale or what everyone's really concerned about it's probably actually made things worse and it was just an interesting thing that i i really hadn't um considered um closely um and so there's a bit of naivety about that so i think um there needs to be um again some broader discussions about you know the consequences of those policies on the economic yep. um, situation in Australia, and and you know we we are in a a privileged um, society. You know we we are a wealthy com- a country, but um, you know people currently with you know the interest rates and stuff like that are sort of um, struggling. But I think maybe we've not realising the relevance of how we fit in terms of other countries and stuff like that. So, you know, we it's all it's all relative, but um, you know, if we continue down this path of um over regulating um industry, making it uh, more difficult, you know, I know even just running a small business, all the um HR stuff that you need to be on top of, um, all the costs associated with those sort of things um it it makes um doing business a lot more difficult um which then affects the economy it just affects people's sort of lifestyle and stuff like that so um 
in terms of go back to the original question, what was it again? Um, the net, the net zero policy. I, I guess it's just trying to um, be a bit more holistic. I think is the word is a pro, uh, understand things from different pers- perspectives. Um, you know, I think I heard um, I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about energy pragmatism. So. Um, and understanding that uh, renewable, you know, wind and 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 solar, um, at the moment are not the solution to everything. Like they can help, but they're not not reliable sort of sources. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, understanding that um, there, there's still a part for our traditional, you know, gas and um, um, yeah, I guess some to some extent coal. Um, to try and actually maintain what our requirements are. And it's interesting, you know, as we get more technology and, you know, you talked before about, you know, chat GPT and <laughs> all, all the AI and the power that goes into running those sort of things. I, I think I, I heard something about how much the power um, in the United States was under pressure because of all these AI developments and all the extra power that that sort of requires. So, you know as we get all these technology advancements, we need to understand that there's there's compromises that need to be done, um, or un, you know, a, the centre around that as well. Yes, crypto as well. That's another huge yep. drain on it. And, um, you know, I've I seen, seen an article the other day about, um, you know, a petrol car and electric car from Sydney to Melbourne and just how much more it costs for the for the electric car to... Yeah, to and, run. and it's even, it's not just, you know, most people, not everyone's charging their car from solar power. So, um, you know, it's not <laughs> just that. It's also the process of manufacturing the batteries and, you know, where the power from that comes from. So it's, I think there's a lot of headline, um, headlines around about, you know, a renewable energy um, and how it, it's going to help the planet and the environment and stuff like that, but um, there's a lot of um, understanding or things that I think that have been left out of the discussion about um, our traditional um, energy sources as well. Yeah, that's it. It's, uh, you know, it seems to be the same type of people just constantly pushing and pushing the same same type of agenda. Um, I reckon that's a discussion for a, well, it is, for another day with some of it. It is interesting, and I think it's. It, I think you made me think about when I was young. I remember um, there was a thing that we we thought the world was running out of oil, and um, and, and why and why are we doing car racing and stuff like that. So I think as young people, you get. Um, you get some information and, and whether it's your parents or school teachers or other kids at school and stuff like that and you, you, you tend to accept a lot of these things. And, yeah. Um, and then it um, becomes, you know, mainstream sort of belief and, um, you know, th- there might be a lot of that going on at the moment. Yeah, I'm just you, – you made me remember of a quote that I brought up um, when we caught up to chat about it um, – but I couldn't remember quite a quite of what it how it went, and I'm just about to Google it right now. You know, live, live stream Google. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's 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 something about being um, liberal when you're young, and then conservative when you're when you're older. I'll just find the exact as. It, Yeah, if you're if you're not a liberal when you're young, you have no heart, and if you are not a conservative when you're old, you have no brain. <laughs> yeah, and it as it's straight straight down that. Sorry for the 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 little <laughs> delay and a pause, but I just had to had to jump on it because we we spoke about it, and it's it just seems to touch touch base. You know, yep. you you said that you did some 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 stuff for you know. Oh, uh, um, Greenpeace. Greenpeace when you were younger and I um, did some conservation fundraising for Australian Conservation Foundation when I was younger as well. So it, it seems to be that that um, yep. way, the way of things and how, how they go. Um, yep. It's just some, some of these people never, never leave that. <laughs> yeah, yes. 
That and was a get long, long time ago. <laughs> but you did mention earlier. We'll we'll finish on a on a happier note. You know, ten with this being a hunting, fishing, shooting podcast. Um, you you mentioned that you got your firearms license, which is awesome awesome to hear. How long ago did you get that, and what um, made you? It probably. I want to say it was not long. Well, it was sort of when we went through that COVID stage when you actually could start doing something again. Yeah. Um, but I used to have a, a slug gun when I was young and used to sh- – on the farm as well, But and then also when I was moved back into the suburbs, um, just shooting targets in the backyard and stuff like that. So I guess I was sort of interested. But, um, yeah, I've I've got sheep on our property and I just felt like – um, sometimes there's a need to have something like that there to, to make um, decisions a bit easier with maybe getting rid of some of the older ones and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I sort of did the target, did the did the course, and um, yeah, I'm a fairly compulsive sort of guy, so I <laughs> sort of built up a reasonably good collection in a short period of time. But unfortunately, I don't really get a lot of time to do much with it now. I mean, we've got um, 80 acres and. Um, we've got a bit of a pigeon problem, so I sort of get the shoddy out sometimes and try to not consistently enough get rid of some of the pigeons we've got on the solar panels. Um, Have you tried eating them? Pigeons? Yeah. No, no. I haven't. No. Uh, apparently, oh, uh, I know for a fact, but they are they are pretty good eating. Um, yep. They're the the feral pigeons that you're talking about are Eurasian rock doves and that's you know the younger ones is as what they serve in restaurants as squab yep um and yeah I, ha- I have wondered that but yeah they're they're, they're <laughs> a pain in the backside um they actually clogged up a gutter on one of our back sheds which affected us because we're all on rainwater here so that has sort of affected us but yeah we've got um sort of rabbits and we've had kangaroos and even uh, we've even had some deer on the back of the, the block a, a few times how good's that <laughs> yeah I, i've only seen them once but um i have been told that they do come around the back sometimes so yeah they well, it's a it's a farming area and there there tends to be quite a few out in the back in the in those areas out there i've seen them and um, you know, I'm, I know that the Australian Deer Association had had a block out there for for a few years chasing them as well. Um, you Around know, Buckland Park. And yeah, stuff like that. yeah, 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 and really good. But um, I did hear a rumor. I'm not sure how true it is, but some of the deer in the area have tuberculosis. So I'm not sure what what's that like. You know, I heard it from an old shooter. Yeah. You know how these things things get around and exaggerated. <laughs> young young people getting manipulated. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, you know, we've been working this out for for a couple of weeks and um, yep. trying to work out how we're going to go about it because you know I'm not a very I'm not a great like a well spoken person. I'm not great with politics, um, but. You know, I, th- I think you've done pretty well, and and who's to say I'm very good at politics at this <laughs> stage? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll find out. But um, you know, your a lot of your um, you know, things that you want to come out of it align with everyone that I know in the hunting and fishing side of things. So it, it's great, great to see, and it's very, very refreshing to hear. Um, and it's it's crazy to see how much of the stuff that's affecting you in the greyhound industry um, is affecting us in the hunting industry and it's the same same type of people that are pushing it. So that's been really yeah. interesting to to learn and, you know, I've, I've learned to have, like I've, I've got a guy that I work with and he races greyhounds. Um, so I brought up, you know, after having the discussion with you that night at the pub, um, about the the insemination stuff, and he had no clue about it. So it was mm. it was cool to be able to go to him and have some information about greyhounds that he didn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's like I said, um, it was funny. It was a funny conversation when I first contacted Rob Borsak. You know, I sort of um, got his number, and um, I, I was sort of like what am I going to say to this guy, you know, like I, I sort of, in the end, I just sent him a text and told him who I am and what I was sort of thinking and he, he sort of rang me back in a short period of time and we, I think we are on the phone for like 30, 40 minutes <laughs> and um, it was, it was I could see we were very aligned. Um, we were talking the same thing. So although 
you know, I, I, it, the funny thing about the greyhounds is I think there's so much propaganda um, and misinformation out there. The general public can't actually make a um, an informed decision about what it's really about, and that, and that's the same with all the other issues that we're sort of talking about. So, you know, as much as I try not to make it um, just about a platform for greyhounds, which is it's not it, it's it's basically a platform for common sense and and um, as I've become aware, it's like you said, it's the same issues affecting um, many people, and it, they're not small issues. So they're, they're things that affect um, large percentages of the, of the population. Um, and like you said, they're, they're the similar actors that are pursuing it. Um, and like I said, for selfish um, reasons or, or, or reasons of total misunderstanding. You know, if they, because they don't understand it, they want to um, outre- over-regulate it or, or regulate it out of existence. Um, and like I said before, I'm interested in the psychology of that and I think it's more about them, not about the issues that they're, they're trying to, to get rid of. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, like like I've said to you numerous times and I haven't said it on the, this podcast yet tonight, but it, it, it tends to be a feelings over facts matter. Yeah, um, yeah. Yep. You know, you've danced around around saying saying it like that, but, yeah, that's at, yeah. The, at the end of the day, it's it's their feelings over yeah. the facts. Emo- of, emotions and opinions over facts. And, and that's, I, I think, I don't know if I've really sort of said it, but I, I think decisions, you need to take, I think my goal is that decisions are based on fact um, and not emotions and not feelings and and not people's opinions. Um, They just need to be based on fact and it needs to be based on fact from a lot of um, information, uh, a broad aspect of of opinions um, so that there's a balance to solid decision-making. Yeah, and that's the hard thing when it comes to these types of things when they're they're pushing their 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 feelings over facts, where we've got the facts, you know, to show, you know, how humane you know hunting is compared to helicopter culling and stuff like that. Just just as an example, but because we're so passionate about it, we're going into it with a lot of emotion and feelings as well which is very hard for for myself to separate my my feelings and my emotions about it and you know I'm coming at it with the facts but I tend to get over emotional when it comes to it <laughs> oh, and, and look I, I, I've definitely been guilty of that um, as well and and I think you need to have that emotion to motivate you to keep you going because there's a lot of things a lot of setbacks you come against and unless you've got that emotion to keep you going, um, you lose your way, or you become ap- apathetic and sort of give up on it. And look, I've definitely matured a lot over my years with experience, and and tried not to let the emotion um, dictate what comes out of your mouth, um, <laughs> which is easier said than done. But um, I think that's the responsibility of um, what I'm sort of trying to do is to um, give another outlet where those things can be aired in a unemotive um, forum um, and be taken at face value and, and, and not be fobbed off um, and swept under the carpet. Yeah, that's it. Like, you know, just going on the emotion stuff, like a lot of my push to say bow hunting and other other forms of hunting has been purely emotion like the more pissed off I'm getting the more uh, the more I'm pushing you know people to pull their finger out write letters to their MPs um you know there's there's petitions there's all sorts I've I've been trying every angle you know messaging international hunters and organizations and trying to see what they can do for us if it does does go down that path you know messaging Robert Borsack from Shooters Fishers Farmers and that's how I got in contact with you you know I'm just like you know I'm pissed off about all of this stuff I'm angry I'm upset and he's like well chat to chat to john and try and work something out and yeah and that and that's pretty much what i've just said you, your emotion has driven something to get a result and and it's just got to be um 
directed in a way that's <laughs> positive, you know, and that's easier said than done sometimes. Oh, it can be, but you know, it's it's given me this this push to, you know, um, you know, some some of the listeners probably won't like the political side of listening to it, but hey, it's 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 something we all need to be passionate about and we need to understand these things and we need to pull our fingers out and stop voting for these these major parties and yep. start um going for the guys that are looking out for our interests and have very similar interests and ideologies to to us you know yes we might not have huge numbers but as you said like south australian firearm numbers firearm owners numbers is is pretty pretty big that can turn that can swing an election for some of that stuff and that's not just in here in south australia you know you got tasmania just had their elections you know they, they're facing lots of different stuff when it comes to deer culling victoria in new south wales you know we've we've got the numbers as firearm owners we can we mm. can really put a dent in some of this stuff mm. and 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 that's a, i think I, I wish I remembered the number, but it, it was a very high number and, and you know, a, a fair percentage of um, the population. And you don't, you don't expect that every one of those person, people were going to, to vote for a particular party. But I, I just think people, if, it, if there's an awareness, um, and I, I, I guess you know that it's either going to be a Liberal or Labor government, but um, so why not put someone... Um, and number one that you know that's going to make things a bit more difficult for them and then yep. you can go with your preferred party after that. It, it, in the end, it's it's not going to change things for the major parties. Um, well, it is going to change things for the major parties if they've got uh, more minority people that are, are going to be strong and vocal against um, these things and, and that's where I guess you get your political power from. Oh, heck, you know, if you had everyone in the racing industry, everyone in the fishing industry, everyone in the hunting and shooting industry vote for, you know, one of these minority parties, that's a, mm. that's a hell of a lot of numbers. Yeah. Like, that's, that's a good chunk of the South Australian population. Yep. And yeah. as I, 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 like I said to Rob when I first spoke to him, I just feel like there's an appetite in South Australia. I feel like it's a perfect storm with a lot of the issues that are going on um, with fishing, with the deer culling, um, with the greyhounds, you know, there's a lo there's a lot of issues, and um, I feel like it's a it's a perfect storm for people to sort of unite a little bit and and try and get um, a, a voice. That's it. Well, John, thank you for for coming on tonight. Um, thank you for letting me come around and bring all the podcasting stuff around here. Um, you know, I, I, I know it can be a little bit intimidating to to start off with, but I I believe you've done an excellent job tonight. Um, we've covered a lot of different stuff. I've definitely taken a lot of stuff that I'll I'll take away and think on and when i'm putting the podcast together i'll i'll be going over it all again you know listening to it yep. um uh, we'll do an, another big push over facebook well a few big pushes over facebook to try and uh get this um membership membership to 200 and get you yeah. on the um on the cards yeah maybe we can do a, a revisit once things are progressed a little bit further yeah 100 percent. and um if is there an email where people can contact you if they want to, you know, at get out on the board? Or At the moment, um, I would suggest just contacting the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers in New South Wales yep. um, until we get the state um, uh, branch opened. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it, so I sort of regularly get emails from from them yep um until we sort of get the the first step up of the way but then once we got that there'll be more official ways to get your opinions being heard yeah beautiful and this does not just go to south australia if you're victoria tasmania any of the other states western australia you know we're all facing facing similar things in the fire in the firearm owners the hunting the racing industry just absolutely everything um you know sign up and become a member of the shooters fishers farmers party why not you know um get your voice heard and get people with like-minded activities and all of that in in charge and telling these uh 
politicians, you know, what what you want to be known, really. Yep. Easy, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Zach. Thanks for having me and thanks for the opportunity to um, get the, the message out there. Not a problem, and I hope to speak to you soon um, when you're when you're actually on the uh, on the ballot papers, mate. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Easy, mate. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Hunting Connection Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed our discussions and gained valuable insights into the world of hunting, fishing, and the outdoors. To stay connected with us and never miss out on an update, please be sure to follow us on social media, all at Hunting Connection Podcast. We appreciate your support and would love for you to share the podcast with your friends and family. Don't forget to tag us in your hunting photos on social media and let us know about your experiences. Your feedback is invaluable to us, so please take a moment to subscribe, rate and review the podcast. Together, we continue growing and delivering more captivating episodes for all hunting enthusiasts. Stay connected, stay informed and keep pursuing your passion for the hunt. Until next time, happy hunting.